Uh, now, it would be great if you could have that Bible reading open uh, on a device of yours or in an old school physical copy of the Bible. As we look at this final passage in our series in the King in Jerusalem, we come to the Great Commission. And that brings me to our first question this morning. What is our purpose in life? Now, you might be thinking, well, Michael, it's about 9.45 a.m. I'm hardly out of my PJs. In fact, I am still in my pajamas. Uh, it's a bit heavy for that. But bear with me here. As a church, what is our purpose? What's our role? What is our mission? Well, in the past month, there's been a lot of change, hasn't there? Uh, we've lost a lot. We've lost our perception of control. We've lost our routines. We've lost some of our freedoms. Some of us have lost jobs. Some of us have lost loved ones. Uh, as a church, we've lost and we've missed physically gathering together, and we will continue to until we can gather in person. And in this time and in this age... What is our purpose as a church? Well, I'll give you a hint. It hasn't changed. In fact, it hasn't changed for the past 2,000 years. It has always remained the same because it has been commanded by none other than Jesus Christ himself. Our mission is to make and mature disciples of our great King Jesus who has all authority. And so today we'll see that we have a universal king. We have the ultimate mission. And we have an eternal presence. So the universal king. Uh, to set the scene here, Jesus has suffered death. He has, he has experienced the full judgment of God. He has been crucified, but now he has risen again meaning that we are forever forgiven and forever raised. And so here, sometime later, uh, Jesus appears to his disciples. The now 11 disciples are told to go up a mountain in Galilee. Now, in the Old Testament times, mountains were places of significance uh, for people being commissioned by God. So uh, people like Moses, like Joshua, like uh, Jeremiah were all commissioned by God on the top of mountaintops. Now, does that mean that mountaintops are more holy than other places? Uh, are we more blessed here in Toowoomba because we are closer to God for some reason? Uh, no, not at all. They are just symbols and common places where God has sent his people out from. So, this should indicate that something significant is going to happen here for the disciples. It's going to be something big. And so they see him. They see the risen King, Jesus Christ. And what is their response? Uh, well, look with me at verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Uh, what's the appropriate response to seeing the risen King Jesus in all his glory? Well, it's falling face down in worship. And laying down our lives in service to him. That is the appropriate response. For he is the lamb who was slain. He is the one who has defeated death. He is the one who is our great king. When people come across Jesus for the first time, uh, the response may be apathy. They may not think much of him. Or even just flat out rejection. On the other hand, when we get to know Jesus for who he really is, as we invest time into finding out more about him, as we worship him in song and set our affections towards him, and as we mature as disciples, as followers, our response should be continually laying down our lives in worship to him. But there's another response here. And that's doubt. It's a little surprising, isn't it? Uh, here are the 11 disciples worshipping Jesus, but some doubted. 
Uh, now, some commentators have tried to argue that, uh, that there was a group of crowd, there was a crowd there, and some of that crowd doubted. Uh, some say that all of the 11 doubted. But the text only gives us this phrase, but some doubted. And the but in the Greek here isn't used to contrast the two responses or put them up against each other, but simply to join them. It could be replaced with and. So why would they doubt? Is doubt a bad thing? Is doubt the opposite of worship? Well, the word for doubt here can mean, also mean hesitation. But it doesn't mean unbelief. So this means for us to worship God, for us to lay down our lives in service to Him, we don't need to have all the answers. We can come and worship God but still have questions because it's not about the quantity of our faith but the quality of it. So when doubts arise and you find yourself asking questions such as, God, what are you doing? Or God, are you still on the throne in this crazy world? Don't panic. Don't be afraid. This doesn't mean unbelief. This doesn't mean that you are unfaithful in your worship. This just means that you're working out your faith. And the fact that some of his closest followers still doubted after seeing Jesus also gives me great reassurance. Because hesitations and doubts arise in them, so why should I be surprised if they arise in me? And notice here, Jesus doesn't say, uh, doesn't come up and speak to his disciples and say, hey, you who are doubters, I know who you are because I'm Jesus. Just go over there for a second and I'll talk to the real followers. No, he includes everyone in his commission. So yes, it's okay to have hesitations. So what does he say to them? Look with me at verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority has been given to Jesus. Not to some, all. Now, some people on earth do have some authority. Our parents have authority over their children. Bosses have authority over their employees. Headmasters have authority over their students. And prime ministers and uh, presidents like to claim that they have authority. Uh, but I don't think that anybody has ever claimed to have all authority over everything. Uh, if somebody was to come up to me and say, uh, I have all authority, I think I would either laugh or be slightly concerned, possibly even both. But you see, there is someone who has said that, who actually means it, and it's actually true. And that is Jesus. Jesus has all the authority over things in heaven and things in earth. It has been given to him by the Father. So he has authority over our leaders, local, federal, and worldwide. He has authority over sickness and pain and distress. He has authority over disease and famine. He has authority over Satan and his schemes. He has authority over the smallest atom and over the furthest planet of what is seen and what is unseen. He has authority over death itself. Now, over the past 12 weeks, as we've looked at these last chapters of Matthew, this is what we've seen all along. That even in the face of trials and temptation and suffering and pain, Jesus is still the one on the throne. Jesus is king. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of Man, as prophesied in Daniel where he wrote, He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. See, Jesus was given all authority, glory, and sovereign power. 
all nations worship him. Jesus' dominion is an everlasting dominion. And Jesus' kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Nothing can take his authority away. No one can ever kick him off his throne. Jesus is the universal king. And so he deserves to be worshipped and followed as such. And because of this, he sends his disciples and us on the ultimate mission. Uh, Now, in church history, there has been tons of ink spilt on what is the mission of the church. Uh, There have been scrolls, books, blogs, articles, vlogs, emails, trying to figure out exactly what it is. I'm sure some of this has been really helpful, uh, but some of it can just overcomplicate things and muddy the waters. But the mission of the church, uh, it isn't complicated. It's really quite simple. It's right here in the passage, in the text. So look at me at verse 19. This is Jesus speaking. Therefore, since Jesus has authority, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So what's the mission? Make disciples. That is the mission of our church. That is our purpose. That is our role. To make people who are followers of Jesus, to make people who sit at Jesus' feet and listen to him, who call him Lord, and who obey his teachings. And part of this will involve evangelism and conversion of people initially turning and following to Jesus and initially repenting. And another part will include the maturing of disciples, maturing of people who are already followers of Jesus into a deeper relationship with him. So this is the core mission of the church. This is why everything that we do here at St. Bart's is dedicated And it's for the purpose of making and maturing disciples of Jesus Christ for God's glory. I hope that sounds familiar. So, how are we to do this? We're actually given quite specific instructions here. Firstly, we need to go. We need to actually do something. Uh, Now, if I remember my 8th grade physics class correctly, with a bit of assistance from Dr. Google, uh, Isaac Newton's first law of motion is that an object at rest will stay at rest unless it's impacted by an external force. So if my cup of coffee is resting on the bench, it will stay exactly where it is until I pick it up and sip from it, uh, which I most definitely will in due time. Likewise, if we as a church are at rest and stay at rest, and don't do anything about it, guess what will happen? We will just stay at rest. You see, for us to fulfill our mission as a church and as disciples of Jesus, we just can't sit on our hands and do nothing and expect something to happen, but we need to go. We need to be active. See, for Israel, their mission was to be a light uh, and to be attractive to people, like moths drawn to a flame. And they were really told to go out to other nations. But now this has all changed. Mission isn't just to be attractive, and that's part of it, uh, but to go. To go out into all the world. And yes, that includes everyone in the world. And yes, this includes Australians. It includes the people on our front lines, our co-workers, our families, and our friends. Uh, We can so easily fall into the trap of thinking that mission is only what those people overseas do, Uh, that you're only doing mission if it's your full-time job and if you're in a foreign land. However, that isn't the case at all. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are on mission right where you are, right now. Uh, Over the past few years here at St. Bart's, we've been doing a lot of thinking about what it means to follow Jesus on our front lines, 
uh, what it means to do mission on our front lines. And, well, most of our front lines have dramatically changed over the past few weeks. So, just take a moment to think about the week ahead. Where will you be this time in a few days' time? Think of the phone calls. Think of the Zoom meetings, the FaceTimes, uh, the time with kids at home, the quick trip to the cafe, or even the workplace. Those are still our front lines. And yes, because of COVID-19, our front lines may have changed or may look different, but the gospel hasn't changed. Our mission has not changed. We're still called to go and make disciples. And this doesn't necessarily have to mean giving a full-on gospel message on every Zoom meeting or email chain or message box, although it could but it could involve intentionally following up someone, uh, praying for them, giving them a call regularly, dropping in some kind of a care package, and then talking to them about the gospel. You may even like to offer to go through our four-week course of introducing Jesus with them. Because why? Because the gospel message is a message that we need to hear and that people on our front lines need to hear. See, this virus is making people anxious, but the gospel offers comfort. This virus is making people fearful, but the gospel offers hope. This virus is making people isolated and lonely, but the the gospel offers a relationship with God. And with us, the church. This virus is making people face their mortality. But the gospel offers life eternal. The eternal love of the Father. For the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Is news that people on our front lines need to hear right now, that we need to continually preach to us. So let's not sit back and kick back and relax, but let's go. Uh, There are also two other things here that Jesus outlines as a must as we make disciples, that is baptism and teaching. Uh, Firstly, baptism is is an outward symbol of an inward spiritual reality. That is, as we are baptised, is it an outward sign that we have died to ourselves and have come under the lordship and under the authority of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We're saying that this life is not our own, but it's to be lived for Jesus. And for disciples of Jesus, and for new disciples, this is so very important. It's not just a nice idea, but it is something which Jesus commands. So if you are a follower of Jesus and you haven't been baptised yet, I'd love for you to get into contact with us. I'd love to chat more about baptism when we're all gathered physically together, back together. And secondly, we must teach. And teaching what? Well, teaching them to obey Everything Jesus has commanded us. See, we can't diminish the role of teaching at all. And we aren't to teach philosophical ideas. We aren't to teach the things that are just easy. We aren't to teach the things that we like, uh, not just our hobby horses, but teaching them everything Jesus has commanded us. Everything in his word. Because our mission of making and maturing disciples is not complete unless it leads them and us to a life of observing Jesus' commandments. And guess what? That is a lifelong journey. See, this is our mission. It's the ultimate mission. 
It's not Mission Impossible, but it's comprehensive. It's global and it's local, but it's not complicated. Make disciples. But how can we do this? What can possibly keep us going in this? Well, the eternal presence of Jesus. Now, a number of years ago, my grandfather insisted on teaching me how to weld for some reason. Uh, Why? I'm not too sure. Have I used this skill since? Uh, No, I have not at all. But here I was, this 12-year-old with a mask and gloves that were much too big for me, wielding this welding stick and welding together a steel frame for a water tank. I didn't feel at all competent or at all confident. Uh, But every step of the way, my grandfather was watching over my shoulder, guiding my hand, keeping an eye on things. And if it wasn't for his presence, I would have no hope whatsoever. (laughs) Now, it's the same for our mission. We can't do this alone, and we don't do it alone. Uh, Look at me at the second half of verse 20. For surely I, Jesus, am with you always to the very end of the age. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This universal king who we saw before is with us. This universal king who we've been exploring over these past 12 weeks is with us. Every hour and every minute and every second of every day. How amazing and phenomenal is this? So this means that even when we feel nervous or ill-equipped or unqualified for the mission, We have everything that we need in the presence of Jesus by his Spirit. At this point in time, the disciples weren't able to fully appreciate this until Pentecost at the coming of the Spirit. But we can right now. Even through times of trials, even through the fall of Jerusalem, our great King Jesus promises that he is with us until the very end of the age. That he is Emmanuel, God with us. So this means that when we are isolated and lonely, God is still with us. When we are in chronic pain, God is still with us. When we're constantly battling with sin, God is with us. When we're anxious about the future, God is still with us. When we're feeling overwhelmed, burdened, troubled, and in distress, God is with us. Wherever we go, whatever our front lines are, whoever is there, God is still with us. So then what is our mission? Well, it's simple. Go and make disciples of King Jesus, who isn't just in Jerusalem anymore, but is king over the whole entire universe. He's king over everything, even death itself. And this same king is with us right now, even until the very end of the age when he comes again. So let's pray and ask him to help us with this mission. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the glories of the gospel. We thank you so much for the forgiveness, for the hope, 
that's offered through Jesus' death, resurrection. Thank you so much that we have this great news to go out and tell the world. To tell the world of the freedom, of the hope, of the privilege that it is to be in relationship with you. Precious Lord, on our front lines, help us to be a gospel light. Help us to constantly point others towards you in the way that we work, in the way that we talk, in the way that we tell other people. Gracious Lord, may you give us boldness to tell of this great gospel, of this great news to people on our front lines, no matter the cost. Gracious Lord, we thank you so much that you are with us, no matter the circumstances, no matter where you are, that you are with us by your Spirit. Precious Lord, please help us. We can't do this mission without you. Inspire us, equip us, and calm us, and help us to rest in you, knowing that Jesus is King. Amen.